I mean, one thing is they have to understand what they own. Mm, okay. And you can't put everything in a drawer and wait till you're 65 and pull it out. You can't, that. you know, yeah. I mean, I guess if you live on ramen, maybe you can, but you know, we don't, we're hoping for a little more life than that. So, you know, take the time. I would say hire a professional, take the time to figure it out because the back of the envelope doesn't work anymore. Mm. Tax laws have gotten complex. The, the different rules with the different types of retirement accounts, they're, they're very different. There used to be just, you know, pensions. And then now there's, like I said, all different types of retirement accounts with all different rules. And, you know, as an accountant, a lot of accountants will do things on the back of an envelope. I don't, you can't do it anymore. You really, really can't. Hey guys, welcome to episode number 206 of the Game On Girlfriend podcast. If you've ever been afraid to hire a financial planner, you're going to be so happy about today's podcast episode. My guest today is Lisa Crosta, and she is a certified financial planner. She has this extraordinary journey through all of the different service mechanisms of money is the best way for me to describe it. Understanding taxes, being a certified accountant, and now being a certified financial planner. She's so much fun to talk to. I almost forgot that we were recording the podcast episode a couple of times. One, because I love money so much. I really do. And we just really dove into what can happen to women when we don't understand where our money is. Um, and what can happen to families when we don't pay attention? There's so much I hope you listen for in today's podcast episode, but the number one takeaway I hope you get is that money can be fun, that you don't ever have to be afraid of talking about your money, especially with someone who's an expert. Um, and she shares a couple stories with all of us about a few clients who were so scared she was going to yell at them <laughs> once they turned over their you know, income and their expenses that that they were going to get in trouble or somehow have to curb their spending. And I do think that that is a number one fear for most of us. So if you've been afraid to kind of open your own kimono and get an expert's opinion on what you could do to support yourself even more with this beautiful money that you're making, hopefully today will help you change your mind. The other thing I do love and I want to point out is that Lisa's company, BPP Wealth, we have the link to their website underneath this video or in the show notes if you're listening. They are a fully woman-owned firm, which makes me very happy. So if you are intimidated, I know, and this happens to a lot of women, even today, if you are intimidated about speaking with money with men, you now have a new outlet to turn to. All right. So you are going to just absolutely love this. Pop in your earphones and let's get to it. Lisa, welcome to the Game on Girlfriend podcast. Thank you. And thank you for having me. All right. So we are talking about something so near and dear to my heart. I might die today. I'm so excited. We are going to talk about money and wealth and women. Women. Yes, please. So, yes, so yes. important. Um, but before we dive into this, Lisa, just so people sort of get a feel for who you are and what you do, one of my favorite questions to ask people is why? Why is this what you do? Like, what is it about helping people grow financial wealth, understanding how to pass on generational wealth? I know that's really important to you as well. Why? What about this really attracted you? Well, you know, I'm going to go back a little bit here. So I, when I graduated college, I took a job and I was trying to figure out a way to work with people instead of within a big institution. Hmm. And so I decided to go get my CPA because I thought CPAs work with people, right? You know, instead of just working for a giant corporation. So I did that. I went back to business school, got my CPA and started working with individuals. And I purposely like worked my way from an auditing, you know, where you have to do a little bit in the beginning as a CPA into tax and then personal financial planning. Right. Because I don't know, I just always wanted to work with people and I enjoy kind of going, you know, finances can be so confusing mm -hmm. and there's so much jargon. There's so much misinformation out there. I just really enjoy talking to people, explaining things to people, I guess. I don't want to say that, you know, people aren't smart, but this is not their field. Mm -hmm. So it's just, I just enjoy working with individuals. So this was a way that I love math. <laughs> so how do you <laughs> math and work with people? This is kind of the way I, I put the two together and it's, it's just amazing what the smartest clients I have that have these amazing professions, you know, doctors, engineers, lawyers, but finance is not their thing. And I, I love having these intelligent conversations with them and walking them through it. And just, they're just being like, oh my God, now I get it. It makes sense. And I can plan, I can achieve my dreams. I can make good decisions. And we always say, when you have clarity, you make great decisions. So true. That's so yeah. true. Yeah. yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's one of the things I love doing with my clients too. I think it's similar in that it's like, well, if you don't have a financial goal for your business, you're definitely not going to hit one. 
Right. <laughs> it's like right? you have to have some sort of clarity around where you want to go next. And I think, tell me, tell me what you think about this, Lisa. We're just yeah. gonna jump right in here. But like I think a lot of people either they saw money as scary when they were younger or it just flat out wasn't explained to them. And now they feel stupid about it. I mean, I know I've gone through that where I'm like a what now and a who and a huh, you know, yeah. just these things just get thrown around. Like you said, yeah. for you, where was there a turning point for you specifically? Cause I know you said you want to work with people, but even as a CPA, that's around money. Like, what is it about money that attracted you to this? You know, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I'm a numbers person. Like numbers were always my best classes in school. Weird writing and math, which doesn't make any sense. No, but... I love it. I, I get that. I get told <laughs> I'm actually one of those people too. I get I it. I just, it's not, you know, I don't know how to split an atom. I'm not a, you know, that's too intense for me. That that math is too intense. This is everyday math that yeah. makes sense with what we do with life. It's not disassociated from the world. Every single person has to decide how to pay their rent, their mortgage, their credit card bills. So it's like everyday stuff. And, and I like that. And when you start talking to people about money, they open up to you about incredible things. I mean, the stories that I have of people when they tell you about how much they spend, it's just, it's very, so it gets very personal and I, and I like that side of it. So I, I think connecting money with, with everyday life is what I find enjoyable. Oh, I think that's actually really cool. Cause it is right. Isn't it like the one unifier? I mean, yeah. money, we all have to deal with it. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I call it the most powerful tool we all have access to. Yeah. Like, right. But, yeah. but the crazy part though, Lisa, is no one teaches us how to use no. it. Like if you could, if you had like a magic wand, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, yeah. uh, we could go back to elementary school. Like, <laughs> I always joke with people. I'm like, dudes, it's fourth grade math. Come on, baby. Right. Like we can figure this out. Like, what would you plan for? Like, what would you have all of us sort of change when it comes to this conversation money? What would you put in? Well, for one, I would, I would have parents talk to their kids about money. Ah. I mean, it's, I talk to my kids at nauseum, but um, like, yeah, mom, you, know, you have to talk to them. And I, you know, I've seen parents do this where they say, you know, they say no to kids and they blame it on money. Like, oh no, you can't have that ice cream or you can't have that. And it's, it's not the money. It's, it's, it's not that they don't have the dollars to spend it. It's maybe because it's it's not healthy or it's right before dinner or you've already bought three things today. And so there's there's two things going on. There's one, there's no discussion about how the concept of how much things cost, but then people also use money as an excuse and it's it's confusing to kids. So, you know, when my kids were younger, if they really wanted an ice cream, I could afford the ice cream, but I didn't want them to have it because it was five o'clock and dinner was in an hour. Mm -hmm. So you have to use it appropriately. And then there's other times where they want something, you're at a concert with them and they want a $400, well, maybe that's too much, a hundred dollar sweater. And it really is too much. Yeah. So using it appropriately as a tool, you know, um, is important and not using it as a crutch when you don't want it, when you want to stop behavior. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So not using yeah. it as an excuse, because I think money can be made the bad guy real quick. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Really easy to yes. do that. Yeah. And then you end up with kids sometimes who just want everything and they have no concept of money or the reason. Mm. So, you know, I think talking about money fixes so many problems and talking about it early. And I know parents are always afraid, you know, nobody wants to tell anybody what they make, right? It's a big taboo in this country, what salaries, and we know how much it hurts women in jobs. I mean, there's yes. tons of studies, right? Yes. So if you, but when your kids are young, it's hard to, you know, give them, you can't tell them what you make. It's confusing. But, you know, you can do things in percentage terms, you know, like, listen, this vacation cost me a month. It took me a month to make enough money to do this vacation. So it's really important. It's a big deal. I'm super excited. But, I, you know, and I think the single best thing is get your kids working. Get as soon as you can. I mean, my kids started working pretty early. I think my daughter was 13. My boys were like 15. But the moment they make money, they realize. And I remember one of my kids, he's like, wow, I got to work all night to be able to pay for that that concert ticket all of a sudden they feel it. They see how much you have to work to pay for something. And there's nothing better than getting your kids working and letting them understand that you have to give something up to get something. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's really important. And that is just the value of, right? Bringing the money in yes. and then consciously making the decisions, right? And, and I think too, what we do is we put emotion on that, right? Like we put morality on yes. it. Like, oh, is that where you're going to spend your money? Yes. Right? As like, yeah, it was hard to earn, 
And now you get to choose where you want to put it next, whether it's in the bank, do you want to put it in, you know, investing in Disney, which my kids love to do, right? Like, like, where do you want to put this based on what you love? And it's just so interesting to watch that decision-making process and to remove the morality from it, which I have a feeling, Lisa, do you have to do that a lot with your clients as well? Like, do they feel guilty or shame or do they think they're a good person? Like, does that come in a lot for you or not so much? No, I have had clients say to me, that they were really nervous to originally share their cash flow and stuff with me. Yeah. And these are successful people that are not a gazillion dollars in debt. I'm like, why, why are you nervous? And then I had a client once tell me that she, she got recommended to me from a friend and she said, I thought you were going to yell at me. <laughs> what am I going to yell at you for? You're, you know? So when, when we said, and we talked about this before, all our planning with clients begins with the cash flow which means we're looking at how much money you're bringing in from all your sources and how much money you're spending. And to a lot of people that screams like budget, I'm in trouble, you know, stop those, those things you read, stop buying coffee. So I say, listen, you buy all the coffee you want. I love coffee. I had one this morning. It was totally decadent, (laughs) but it's, it's what's done at the end of the, it's where you are at the end of the month to get to what you want to do. Like, are you flat and you're happy? You know, are you negative and getting into trouble? Are you positive and saving enough to you want to be? And, and everybody's individual. So it's not so much what you're spending on. It's just what's the net at the end? Mm. And is the net getting to you to where you want to be? Um, you know, for some people, they want to save, they want to be positive three, $4,000 at the end of the month because they want to sock away tons of money. Other people are happy just to, you know, put their 401k aside and, and, and the rest of it they spend. And we give them projections. Okay, if this is what you do, this is about where you'll be when you're going to retire. I mean, it's a projection. There's a a lot of assumptions, but they're good numbers. And you can make, that's going back to making great decisions. You can see that if this is how you live, this is probably where you're going to be when you're 65 or so. That may or may not be good for you, but don't you want to know? I love that. Yeah. It's just, it's just information, but I think yeah. it's so interesting that people are scared you're going to yell at them, yeah. that they're embarrassed. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, like so much emotion around money. So much emotion. And if yeah. I read one more article about don't get that coffee once a day and you're going to be a millionaire, I mean, you know, I'm not a big fan of the whole, and I'm not begrudging who wrote the book, Millionaire Next Door, because the goal is not in my mind, and I think most of my, they accumulate the most. It's not like who has the biggest pile. It's can you do what you want to do with what you have, right? Love it's it. Experiences, not the total pile. Oh, preach on it, sister. Yes, I love that because it really isn't like, I think so much, we were talking about this in in the Abundance Academy, all of the students we were talking about, you know, I have a a credit card elimination plan for them and stuff and just for them to use however they want to use. But I just love that you said that because they were like, well, but do I have to? I'm like, no, it's about what works for you. And I think what can happen, I love what you said is people are like, but if it's money in, money out, you're going to get mad at me and tell me how to budget. And I hate that word or where they get scared or there's a limit or I'm going to, I can't get what I want. So I really like your approach, Lisa, of saying, no, no, no. It's about what you want to do with it. Yeah. And it's about how you want to feel and what you want to accomplish in your life. And I just love that you put that piece in. And I hope everybody listening, just like their shoulders (laughs) just dropped for a hot second. They're like, Oh, okay. I can do that. I have one, like, it's just so accessible when we talk about it that way. And it's not scary. I have, I have one funny line. I always say to my kids, I'm like, because I don't like the thing where, no, we can't afford it. I mean, granted first class tickets to Hawaii, the answer is no, but in general life. And so I think to my kids, if you want a pair of Lulu pants, the shirt's going to come from Marshall's. That's so, you know, there's a balance. I mean, even some things are really worth it for in, a, in a closed stand where they're going to last for years, but then some of it's going to come from Marshall's. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> I yeah, joke about that. that all the time because my kids were like, one time I got this, it was the most beautiful card again, right? My daughter <laughs> looked at it and she's like, that's $300. I'm like, well, yeah, but I'll wear it for the next 30 years. And the t-shirt I'm wearing underneath costs eight. She's yeah. like, oh, I'm like, yeah, you see how it goes? Like, <laughs> like just, that and, just reminded me of that. Yeah. And it's, it's so a, fun it's to play. It's a good thing to think about because sometimes yeah. you, just, you don't want to go through life saying no, no, no. Right. Right. But you know, when you say yes to certain things that maybe other things, there's a balance, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, oh, I, love. I do want to bring up one thing because you said about, you know, kids and we do work a lot with generations. So we, you know, we have the older generation. A lot of times we'll, there's one big family we have that we work with, you know, all three generations, but a lot of times we'll start working with the children. And sometimes it's just, you know, college age kids that the parents just want us to be able to talk with um, and talk through stuff with, and just getting them comfortable to talk about education, excuse me, about money. Um, When there's, a lot of money and maybe the older generation didn't talk about it. You know, we really try to 
we're trying to really educate because when there's an older generation that made all the money, those, those are people that have a hard time usually talking about it. Right. You know, it's interesting. It's, it's it's always, if you've always been like this your whole life, you're more comfortable, but if you made a lot and you didn't start with a lot, those are the people that we really like to work with the generations down so that they learn because that, that first generation tends to keep quiet about it, uh, especially when there's a lot of money. So we, you know, we do family meetings sometimes with our clients where we talk about, you know, what's the generation, what's, excuse me, the generational giving, you know, what are the goals of the family? We even have families that have their core values. So the core values may be, you know, we want everybody to give to some sort of community. We want everybody to work, education, whatever it might be, but we actually work on them with their core values. Oh, and it, that is it brings so everybody cool. together. Yeah. Ah, I'm kind of just, I was like stunned for a second. I was like, that sounds amazing. I know. I and mean, we started it with, you know, the bigger, the, the bigger families with gen- really generations of wealth, but I've done it with more families and it's, it's interesting. And, and there are people are more open about it when you just start the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I was just, I would love to hear, I would love to like be a fly on the wall during those yeah. conversations, by the way, yeah. I'm, my son goes off to college next year and I'm already okay. like, they are going to hand you credit cards like candy. No, it's they like don't anymore. They're hooking you right up. They don't do that anymore? No. Oh, thank goodness. Nothing like when we went to school. And I will tell you, I have a a tip for you if you want it. Tell me, tell me. I love it. So um, when we were, when I was in college in the, in the 80s, God, I hate saying that, um, you know, you walk into the bookstore, they just hand you credit cards. So my oldest is 25 and she, when she went to get her first credit card, you know, she was eight and 18, 19 and you can't get them. So there's some credit card companies that will give you you know, really low limit, like her first credit card at a $200 limit. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that come in the mail. They're the, some some of the banks you've heard of, you know, they'll give you a $200 credit limit. And that's the place to start. That's the, I have every single one of my kids, my youngest is about to do it. We'll get, we'll start with that credit card. And then over time, the limit will increase a little bit, but it's the only way to start building their credit. Right. If they have student loans, that also helps. If they have any federal, any student loans that will help as well. But they don't give the credit cards out as easily. So you have to consciously choose to get one of those easy cards. And I don't, I don't, I guess it doesn't matter. We use Capital One and Discover, the ones you see all the time in the mail. Yes. yes. But literally $200 limit. So they can't go crazy. So great. They learn to pay it and their credit starts and then it'll move up, but not crazy. They're not going to have a thousand dollar limit in a few months. Oh, that's wonderful. But no, you, thank you for that. If you don't consciously do it, they could graduate college if they didn't have student loans with no credit. Got it. Which is also a problem, right? It is so a there's problem. that balance, like you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to do it. Them, set, yeah. Setting them up in the right way to, to, to sort of introduce themselves to this world of money that we all, like you were saying, we all have to deal with on a daily basis. Well, and to yeah. understand that you have that 25 day grace period. Like if you don't pay it, I had remember explaining this to my kids. If you don't pay it in full, there's not just interest on what you already charge. There's interest on everything you charge until that card's paid off in full. And I remember my kids were like, huh? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What? Yeah. That, like, no one <laughs> teaches you that. So yeah, it's it's a really yeah. good, slow, nice way to start. And it teaches them how to pay you know, a bill and the, the due date and the whole value of money. Wonderful. Well, I think I know what I'm doing this weekend. Thank you so much for that. I'm so excited. Um, yeah, because I think too, what happens a lot for also men and women, are you still seeing in this upcoming generation, let's talk about them first, then we'll get to those of us who are in our generation. But, you know, for these kids coming up, are you still seeing that the conversations are not happening as often with girls as they are with boys? Is that changing in this next generation? I don't see that happening at the like the college age kids level. Yeah. I don't, I don't see too much of that. And I have spoken to, like, I can think of off the top of my head, a few clients that have asked me to speak to their college age kids. And it's probably two boys and two girls that I've spoken to women and men, sorry. Um, but they were 19. I know, so, right? It's hard. They're in that weird phase of like, are you a man? Are you think a woman? So. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I think though, when both parents are involved with the money, I think it's better, you know, mm. and, and we have this conversation frequently has sometimes, you know, tasks get divided. And for just a lot, for whatever reason, sometimes men end up with the money and it's not all the money. The women may do the budgeting and the bill paying, but the men are doing the investments. Mm. And sometimes it keeps the women end up out of the loop from what we've seen. And we, that's why they, the women love hiring us because we spend a lot of time. We educate, we go over stuff. They understand what they own, why they own it. And that's where sometimes we find the women weren't paying as much attention as the men were. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. And I know you do a lot of work with women who've been divorced or widowed or who aren't married, right? Because I do think there tends to be a gap when a woman is alone, 
right? Versus a woman who's in a, a lifelong partnership. So yeah. what is that gap there? And what do you find for most women? Like if someone's listening today and they're like, oh my gosh, I don't even know how much I have in all of my 401ks that are in 15 places. <laughs> like, yeah. There's so much going on. How much do I need to have by the time I retire? What should I be doing? How would someone help figure out that gap? What do you think is yeah. the most important thing someone could do listening today? So just to clarify, so the women that have been alone, they're yeah. fine, right? They're fine. It's the women who get divorced. There's a ton of gray divorce now, right? Men die before women most of the time, mm -hmm. um, you know, or maybe they've been in a, you know, they, they I find the women that choose not to get married and are managing themselves are fine. It's when they're relying on somebody else and then they end up with divorce or death. Got it. Get, they get sideswiped. Okay. And I just did a workshop on this is how, is how to get yourself to understand, because I think the stat is something like over 80% of women die alone, much, much more than men because of wow. great divorce and men die early. So we are going to have to manage this money at one point. So we don't want to wait till it's the you know 11th hour. So, you know, when we do a financial plan with a client, we spend a ton of time going over, like I said, all the income, where does it come from, all the expenses. But it's also understanding how you have the money, like you have a retirement account and people get so confused. You have a 401k, you have an IRA, maybe you have an inherited IRA, maybe you have a Roth and you have a little pension from seven, you know, 12 years ago, that's worth 50 bucks. And people don't understand the titling of all these assets and how mm -hmm. they work from a tax standpoint and how they work from an inheritance standpoint. Because if somebody dies, right, if your spouse dies, there's different rules. If it's a retirement account, if it's a regular brokerage account, if it's a, you know, if it's a joint. And so we try to really make them understand this is what you own. And if something was to happen to either one of you, this is what's going to happen. And this is who it's going to go to. Um, and this is how it's going to be taxed because there's different rules. I mean, there's, I, I couldn't do all of them right now. We'd need another hour. <laughs> I bet. I bet. We just want people to understand what they own. And, you know, when, where we help a ton, I mean, we help in the building stage, but I'd say we're even more valuable when people flip the switch and they start to retire. And so where do we take the money from? Mm. You know, and so we really go over with clients and we're doing it right now with a really big client. He just retired, husband and wife. They're super smart couple, you know, and she wants to know where the money's coming from. Well, both of them do because he's retired. Yeah. So like, okay, we're going to take this from this account and this from that. We explain it all to them. And to make it easy, what we do is we pour every all the income that comes into one account and then we send them one check a month. Got it. Okay. It's like they get their new salary. <laughs> yeah, no, I got it. Yeah, no, that's their new income, right? We like that's it. what that is. Yeah. yeah. We manage it all under the hood and there's a lot of tax consequences. We, you know, thought processes go into when we make those decisions, but we go over it all with them. And some clients like to understand it more than others, but it's there and the information's there. And then the software that we use to do financial planning um, has a client side. So they can log on. It's oh, live. Right. We keep it. When we do our financial plans. We keep this software live. You can see it anytime. So we go on all the time and we look with them and say, look, this is where it's coming from. Mm. And this is, you know, we kind of, you can see it. It's a better way to see it. And the other thing the software does, which helps people really understand, especially if there's a gap is we can ask what if questions. So Ooh. you put all your stuff in, right? You've got all yeah. these accounts, you've got this income expense. Okay. Look, it spits out, you know, we put really conservative rates of return. Like we don't even do historical. We just lower it. All right. It looks like you're going to have about this much when you retire. So that means you can spend about this much. We put social security in there. And then they say, well, what if I quit my job five years early? Or what if so-and-so gets laid off? Or what if there's a, another recession? Like, so we can model in all these scenarios, pretty much any scenario you can think of and play with it and say, okay, this is what, this happens. This is what, and look how the numbers change. And we've had quite a few people, I've had quite a few over the years who have changed jobs or quit jobs after doing plans, because in these cases, they weren't very happy. Right. <laughs> and where I was able to show them, look, you're making this much, but you can make this much and be okay. Or you can take a year off, figure it out and restart. Oh, that's so cool. Clients, you know, yes, you can retire, but if you look, work for two more years, look what happens. Like it takes all the pressure off. And so it depends on the question. And, you know, there's around us, there's a lot of questions buying a second home, you know, um, giving money to the kids. Can I mm -hmm. gift all my kids? You know, I just did a plan with somebody I was working on. We had all modeling to give to all the kids, all the grandkids, down payment, loan, like everything. And we just kept adding stuff. And he was like, okay, I can do it. And we reassess it all the time. We don't <laughs> really go, but it's, it's really fun for people That's like crazy. that. 
to so give exciting. Kids, your kids and know that they're going to help each grandkid with the 529. It is, it's, it's oh. so cool when you can do it. So cool. Oh, that's so exciting. And so I think too, but listen, just going back, because I know we have women yeah. listening. I think the answer, when I said like, what is one of the first things we can do? It's like just understanding where all that is, understanding what you already own, I think would, would be step one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that like really like just understand where all of it is yeah. and what you can actually do with it? Yeah. I mean, we do it. So when we start a cash flow, it's the income and the expenses, but it's also all the assets. So our little sheet that we use to onboard a client, you know, our onboarding document, it's not that sexy of a name, (laughs) asks for all your assets, all your liabilities. And liabilities are key. You know, people have, nobody remembers when their mortgage is going to be paid off. and, And people forget that when they refinance, they restarted that 30 or 15 year ticker. People forget that all the time. They're like, I've lived in my house for 30 years. It's all paid off. I'm like, no, it's mm. not. You refine it. <laughs> <Here's the go. laughs> so we 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 really to do a plan, we gather all of that. So it's a little lift on our clients, sh- you know, to do. It's a yeah. commitment. Um, and like I said, we do charge these plans, but we are all in. I mean, we're gonna help you find everything and understand everything so you know where to go. I mean, I had a client have no, you know, clients find accounts. The client really? showed thirty thousand dollars the other day, had no idea ah. she went to roll over old 401ks, and it turns out there was two. <gasps> Like, oh, that's exciting. I was like, okay, <laughs> we just found the $30,000. Like, you know, but yes, you have to it. understand what you own, how it's titled and how it is invested. You know, you don't want to retire. I found retirement accounts in cash, in cash. Oh boy. That's so much lost, lost potential. I mean, you don't have revenue. to do yeah. cash. Yeah. You know, we will look at everything. And, and when we do all that, we also look at all your insurances and then we, you know, I think I mentioned this, like our whole circle comes with our name. So the B is the build. So our, our firm's name is BPP. So B is the build. So that's all the cash flow, understanding all the investments. And that's the biggest piece. I mean, we could take, we'll take months to do that, you know, depending on the client. And then we go to P, which is protect. So we'll look at all your insurances, you know, make sure you're in good shape, whether it's life or health. You know, we don't do much with health, but life, long-term care, you know, your umbrellas. And then the last P is preserved. So that's all your documents. You know, do you have the right documents in place, the right beneficiaries, just, you know, all the preserving for generations is the last piece. And it's a circle. So we're constantly, you know, every year going back, checking it. I just looked at a client's account and I saw she didn't have a beneficiary on an IRA, a big account. Oh, dear. Okay. Fix that. <laughs> so, you know, we're trying to always close the circle. Got it. Oh my gosh. I, I just got so excited. I want to go look through all my documents right now. I just got super happy. Oh my gosh. I love this. And so did much. you see you got divorced? Did I hear it? Yes. Okay, yeah. so you really should check those beneficiaries. I'm so excited. I'm all over it. But yes. Yeah. I mean, I think this kind of stuff, like it doesn't like just happen. Right. Yeah. And we forget. And that's what we you were forget. saying at the very beginning, right? This is a day to day kind of like interaction we have with money. And it's so easy. I'm a big fan of Marie Kondo. I swear to God, this is going to make sense. But like her whole thing about the life-changing magic of tidying up. And she said, she has this phrase all throughout the book, which is, if you can't see it, you don't own it. Mm-hmm. Meaning you forget yeah. about it. Yeah. Right. And I think that's what happens on these documents, right? As we sign them that one time yeah. and then we forget, right? Because we don't see it. So we don't own it, right? In our own heads, it's gone away. So I love you're describing the software that you guys use and how people can check in and see it because then you remember. And we more. ask for the documents. How many times I've seen a document that's not signed? People think oh my it's goodness. Not, and it's not signed. Mm. So it's not it's not valid if it's not signed. Oh my gosh, um, it just made my heart flutter. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. Yeah. 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 yeah we're, we're, you know, we have, we are big fans of having power of attorneys and healthcare proxies for your, you know, your kids or your spouses or whatever, because, you know, things happen and, we just had one the other day. The power was never signed. So it's oh, wow. pointless. And they probably paid an attorney to do it. You know, or, or clients set up trusts and then they don't ever put anything into the trust. Anyway, <laughs> there's lots you of know, fun stories, I'm sure. But it happens, right? It like happens. it's like, and that's the whole thing I love about what you're sharing here is it's like no judgment. It could happen to yeah. any one of us, right? Like this is just what life looks like and these days. This yeah. is our specialty. That's why you hire us. You know, we we find that clients that are comfortable hiring professionals are the ones that do well with us because they understand this is our expertise and, you know, we're going to pull you along because we need you to do it. Right. But you have your expertise at work and this is not your expertise, no matter how smart you are. Right. right? Nor should it be. It's ours. Right. Yeah. Right. And I always say that everybody has a full-time job. So we're trying to help you, you know, not have another full-time job. I love it. I love it. 
All right. So there's one question throughout all of this, Lisa, I wanted to ask you at the very beginning, you said there's a lot of like misinformation out there about money and, and humans. Um, if there was like one, <laughs> since we invented it, but if there was like one, uh, like common thread, one misunderstanding that you find to be the most common, what would it be? What would you want people to know? What would you want them to take away from the podcast today? Oh gosh, one thing. You know, we kind of said it. I mean, one thing is they have to understand what they own. Mm, okay. And you can't put everything in a drawer and wait till you're 65 and pull it out. You can't, that. you know, yeah. I mean, I guess if you live on ramen, maybe you can, but you know, we don't, we're hoping for a little more life than that. So, you know, take the time, you know, I would say hire a professional, take the time to figure it out because the back of the envelope doesn't work anymore. Mm. The tax laws have gotten complex. The the different rules with the different types of retirement accounts, they're they're very different. There used to be just, you know, pensions. And then now there's all like I said, all different types of retirement accounts with all different rules. And you know, as an accountant, a lot of accountants will do things on the back of an envelope. I don't you can't do it anymore. You really, really can't. And then when you add kids into the picture and and debt and potentially college and mortgages, you know, it's putting it in one place everybody I just think everybody should have a financial plan you know? yeah <laughs> I love it okay so young one misconception is that you can figure all of this out by yourself in a day right. and you when can. you're having and a beer even, or something even my young clients sometimes I say to them you know do your plan this year and you guys don't need to do it every year so you're 26 like I have one client that's 27 or something and you know we do charge annually I said right you do yours we'll come back in five years like you're in good shape we're getting you set up but you know, as you get older, you we do them annually, and it's it's incredible having a they have a place to call. Like people call me, I'm about to lease a car. Is this a good interest rate? No, no, it's <laughs> not. Run, whatever yes. it may be, you know. And so, yeah, take it off the back of an envelope and, and get a professional to help you with it because it's you'll just do better, you know. Oh, I love it. I love it. Okay, Lisa, this has just been an absolute joy uh, <laughs> to spend this time with you today. Um, before we run off, if anybody's like, oh my gosh, I got to get me some more Lisa in my life. <laughs> um, where can people find you? So, um, the company is BPP. So it's, it's hard to hear. I know the P's it's build, protect and preserve wealth. That's the website, bppwealth.com. And the LinkedIn is also built BPP or me, Lisa Crosta, which sometimes is hard to spell when you're hearing it on a podcast, but <laughs> you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, not really on Instagram. We're not financial advisors. Aren't really on Instagram these days. <laughs> right. I could get that. I could get that. Oh um, my gosh, Lisa! Yeah. Thank you so much. I've so appreciate you stopping by and sharing so many gooey nuggets with all of us to take and think <laughs> about and enjoy and to to protect. You know, all of this money we work so hard to earn. Yeah. Um, and don't be embarrassed to ask questions. And we are 100% female firm. So any <gasps> women are afraid of men, they can come to us. <laughs> love, love. All right, Lisa, no. thank you so much. Thanks I'll talk so to you much, soon. Sarah.